Well, it's a real uh, honor and privilege to be with you here uh, tonight, and uh, what a wonderful meal, and to see all the faces of the farmers that we've just um, fellowshiped with, that, that our three trillion member internal community is now uh, 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 partaking of your gifts and talents. Appreciate that. Oh, sorry. John just said, get up. I'll be back. We're really sorry. We wanted to show you a great video that uh, Chipotle put together, and it's called Back to the Start. And it's about going back to sustainable farming and really good farming, which is what we should be doing. And I believe they have it queued up for everybody to watch. Right. But they had been getting their pork uh, elsewhere, I, I mean, from, from uh, other places, and it really pushed them to go find Diamond Ranch. They started using Diamond Ranch some. And um, one of our customers, one of our, we service um, about 5,000 families in 30 metropolitan uh, buying clubs, drops in the Northern Virginia, Washington, D.C., Southern Maryland, Richmond area, all right? We don't go more than 200 miles from home. 200 miles is our cutoff. We don't deliver anything more than 200 miles. So anyway, <clears throat> one of our customers turned out, we didn't know this, he was the regional mid-Atlantic manager for Chipotle. And when he got our pigs, our pork, uh, he just picked up like any regular person at the buying drop. When he got our pork, he realized how much better it was than the pork they were using, even though they're the very natural, you know, uh, product. And um, so he then contacted Steve Ells and said, uh, hey, let's, you know, um, this, this is really better. Is there any way we could get this into Chipotle? And so Steve Ells of the Denver, the Denver group, the chef, the uh, head meat guy, the quality assurance team, they all <coughs> raised a field trip out to, to Polyface and uh, spent, spent the day. And at the end of the day, we started brainstorming, how can we do this? And it was fascinating how much, um, how much they were able to, they were just an amazing corporate uh, uh, client. They're not perfect, trust me, they're not perfect. I'm not perfect, okay? So, <coughs> but, their heart was in the right place. And um, so they said, yeah, get, uh, we got to do this in the Charlottesville store, which is 30 miles away from us, very close. We have a lot of customers in Charlottesville. But they said, uh, well, we have, to, we have to teach our staff how to cook, because we don't cook in the restaurants. So they had to go find um, furniture. They call it furniture, you know, the, the cooker special stoves and things, to do the cooking in-house. They had to fly the chef, their, their corporate chef out, teach the staff how to cook. I mean, it's funny you have to teach a staff how to cook in a restaurant. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, they did this. Meanwhile, um, we had agreed on, on a number of hogs that they needed, which was, you know, about uh, seven a week, every week. And we were not producing that many. So because we were only producing about 200 a year, and so we needed to pretty much double in order to add Chipotle, or more than double. And we said, we need a year to grow into this. I mean, you know, you can't. We don't have a warehouse where you just call up the warehouse and say, put another two tons on the house. You know, you got to get the little, get the little piggy in and you've got to you know, throw it out. There's a, there's a lag time. So, uh, so anyway, so they said, okay, a year is fine. Um, and what we'll do is, I'm getting ahead of the story. <clears throat> what, what they tried, <clears throat> they got our pork, and they cooked it, and they served it in a restaurant, and they didn't say anything, nothing. The very first day they used it for the carnitas, customers, several of them, regulars, after they got done eating, instead of going out to their car, they came back into the, to the sales counter, asked to speak to the manager, and said, we don't know what you did to the pork this week, today, but whatever it is, do it. It's the best we've ever had. That was completely customer uh, driven. 
driven. Yeah, I mean, I, they, they, they picked it up. And as soon as that happened, of course, the manager you know, went up the chain of command and then Chipotle realized, ooh, we got, we got something going on here. And so uh, we started servicing them. And we did two days a week. And, and of course, you know, they, we didn't have enough. We'd do two days a week. Well, in about four months, they came to us. We had an agreement for a year for us to, you know, to, to ramp up and face them. We had to get more waterers. We had to get, you know, feeders. We had to make more pig pastures, drive more electric fence posts, um, uh, you know, lay more water line, put on electric fence in more pastures. I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff here going on besides finding producers that will raise more pigs. I mean, Virginia has twice as many pigs today as it did 30 years ago on a tenth of the farms. Wow. That's the consolidation and the, the centralization of the pork industry. <clears throat> used to be everybody had a couple pigs out back, you know, uh, and fairer, and now nobody does, but they've got them all in the climate house. So, uh, so anyway, you know, we were rocking along there. We got this call. said, this isn't working. So, oh, you know what? And they said, we can't do this. We have to have all that. We have to have full service now. So well, we, don't, we don't have to pay us. And they said, well, but we're making all of our customers mad. They come in here, they get your pork two days or three days. Then they come in on a weekend or whatever, bring their friends to get this amazing carnita. And then it's the other stuff. And we're back, and they're another mad, and we can't afford to have mad customers. So we've got to ramp this up. So then we had a decision to make: Do we say no and risk losing the account, or do we say, okay, we will dip down deeper into what we would call unfinished hogs, lighter, lighter animals, dig deeper into our inventory, lose money for six months? in order to, 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 to ramp it up. And that's what we decided to do. We decided it was worth, um, that the account was worth losing money for six months, dipping down, so we, you know, we dipped down into 175 pound hogs instead of making them all two, 300 pounds to try to ramp up this, this, this thing. And, and we did, and, and um, so that's, that's, the, that's the story. There were fascinating things. Uh, I'll, I'll just give you one little sideline. Uh, they had an internal policy that no, uh, no deliveries could come to Chipotle unless they came in a refrigerated truck. That was one of their internal protocols. We don't have a refrigerated truck. We have about 250 coolers, um, but we don't have a refrigerated truck. And what we found is that ice and coolers, you can buy 200 coolers for the price of one Thermo King repair. <laughs> so, so we use we use coolers and ice, and that's how we deliver our meat and poultry and stuff like that. We service about 50 restaurants, and um, so so their quality assurance people when they found out we were going to go to the slaughterhouse with the pigs, bring them back to the farm in in, in cryopack you know packages in ten they did it in uh, ten pound baggies of bite sized boneless uh, pork, and. Um, the quality assurance said, "Oh, wait a minute! You know, this is a, this is coming back to a farm. A farm is dirty. It's stinky and smelly and dirty, and, and it, it, they're not going to go in a refrigerator truck. I mean, they just went out the So, um, so they actually sent out the Denver quality assurance team, and they went to the slaughterhouse. They rode in our truck. They they, they looked at our walk-in freezers, coolers." They rode in the delivery vehicle to the restaurant. They still had this temperature problem, though. How can we assure this temperature? And I don't know whether you know about temp strips. Temp strips are little band-aid size um, temp strips that were developed when when the uh, the high diesel prices <laughs> spiked in whatever 19 or, or in the year 2000 or something like that. And what what the uh, the refrigerated truck drivers found out was when they were going from, from slaughterhouses in Omaha, Nebraska to Philadelphia, if they turned off their refrigeration unit, they could sell, they could save $300 in diesel fuel going across the country, and they could turn them on in time to be at temperature when they arrived on an unloading dock in Philadelphia, so the little box of temp you know, temperature probes 
yep, it's that town, they check it. Well, then the meat would go bad in you know three or four days. So the industry was struggling. What's going on? It took them a major, you know, kind of um, investigative time to figure out what was going on with the truck drivers. So the industry developed temp strips. They're about a band-aid size. You could get them for 12 hours all the way through, like you know, 200 hours, and it goes in the package at the slaughterhouse. And stays in the package until the until the final customer, final customer pulls the temp strip out of the package, sticks it in a USB port on a laptop computer, and it gives 30-minute incremental real-time temperatures from the time it went in until the time it came out. And they said, yes, yes. they said, here's what we'll do. We'll just buy you a package of those, put them in the slaughterhouse, and as long as they're temp, we don't care. And I love it. I love it when the things developed for globalism are co-opted to be the entry point for localism. And so that's exactly what we did. We did that, we did that for about six months until they realized, yeah, these people know what they're doing, and then we just continued it. But it, but it, it, you know, it assured them that everything was okay and we knew what we were doing. So that's just one of, of, of several fascinating elements to this, to this story of, of uh, Dancing with Chipotle. It's, it's, it's quite a deal. Right now, uh, where we are today, we service two restaurants. Oh, i got to tell you this. The Charlottesville restaurant, Chipotle has, whatever, uh, like 1,200 restaurants in the U.S. And uh, every one of them, they use uh, beef, pork, and chicken. And, um, and every one of them, of all the restaurants, the ratios of the three different meats that they use, those ratios are within 1% in every restaurant in the country. In other words, the, the ratio of, pork, of, of poultry, of chicken, to beef, to pork, doesn't vary more than 1% from restaurant to restaurant anywhere in the country, except one. Charlottesville, 30% off on pork, which shows that even in that fast food market, people respond to story, they respond to integrity, and they respond to taste. And um, so now, they've been bugging us for a couple of years now to expand into some Northern Virginia uh, Chipotle's up around Washington, D.C., and um, so, about 18 months ago, we firmed up a, a, a kind of a handshake agreement, no contract. We just said, okay, if, if you really want to do this, we'll, we're not going to go outside of Virginia, but if you really want to add a couple more, because the beauty of Chipotle is that they only use the shoulders and the hands, which gives us a lot of um, loins. So you know, we service a lot of upscale restaurants, and we never have enough loin or bellies, you know, for, for um, bellies and um, ribs and so um, so this is a way for us to get you know to get more of our gourmet restaurant service with the whole with the upper uh, with the other stuff and so we said well we'll do it but we're going to need at least a year to ramp up uh, another another level going to double again from 500 hogs a year to a thousand hogs a year so um, they said okay that's fine take you know Take your year, that's fine, and we'll get our stuff ready on our end, that'll be fine. Well, during that time, they they realized that for them, and I, I can't answer all the questions, all I can tell you is what I know, is that in-house cooking is too uneconomical for them. They cannot, they cannot cook with their model, they cannot cook in-house in every restaurant, scratch cooking economically. Right now, most everything is frozen on pallets and goes to Chicago commissaries where it's cooked in massive, I mean, I don't know, they've probably got cookers that you can drive a tractor trailer into and, and, and cook in a huge scale and then truck back out to restaurants where it's reheated and just bare and just finished. <clears throat> so so um, they said, we can't do the in-house, but we're going to try a hybrid, a new idea. Never been, you know, we never tried this before. So we're going to find a commissary, a regional commissary, that, will, that can cook for maybe 20 restaurants. Just, just you know, 
downscale the Chicago deal and, and will cook regionally. And that way, you and there's there's another one, two, three, there's about three more pastured, uh, pastured pig farmers, um, you know, within a hundred miles of us that could feed into this commissary in DC. And that way they could service, you know, more of their restaurants around DC. So they looked and looked and looked, and they found a commissary that would do it. They worked with them for about three or four months, got the recipe right, the cooking protocols right, got it all set up. So we're ready to go live March 1 this year, 2012, March 1, okay? So we're all ready to go one week before March, and we've, you know, we've spent a year ramping up from, from you know, 500 hogs a year to 1,000 hogs a year, which I don't know anything about raising pigs. That's a lot of pigs on pasture. It takes a lot of land, a lot of forest, a lot of pasture. This spring we rented a, we rented a neighbor's 25-acre uh, field and put in uh, 40 half-acre pig pastures with double electric fence, water line, so that we can run four simultaneous 50 hog groups in 10 half-acre paddocks, moving them every few days uh, in a 10-paddock in a rotation on a 40-paddock grid. I mean, this is, this is sophisticated. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big deal, okay? But trust me, it's way less infrastructure than a, than a Smithfield confinement factory with, with manure lagoons, slurry pits, and concrete and fans and energy and all that. I mean, they're just out on a pasture, you know, under scrubby trees. They're eating grass. They're rooting in the ground, rooting out the honeysuckle, and um, it, it, easy infrastructure. So anyway, um, so here we are, one week before March 1, we're ready to go, and they call us and we got a problem. And you can imagine the pigs in our pipeline now, okay? The pigs are coming in our pipeline. You guys laugh. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You got this inventory, you know, <clears throat> coming out. And because we're now we're now gonna be going 20, think about this, 20 hogs every single week of the year to slaughter. So that's a pipeline. You know, that's it. So um, I said, we got a problem. So what is it? They said, this commissary is way too expensive. We just, we just can't, it won't work. We've, we've had to fire them. Oh my, okay. So, so what does that mean? And here's the integrity of, 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 of Chipotle. They said, we said, look, we've got all these pigs coming on. You know, what are we gonna do? They said, here's our commitment. They said, we made an agreement, and remember, this is not a signed contract. This is just, you know, talking, all right? We agreed to take those pigs. We will honor that, even if it means that you have to go ahead and slaughter them, freeze them, pull pork in 10-pound vacuum seal bag baggies, put it on a pallet at the slaughterhouse, let it stockpile to two, four, six thousand pounds, and we'll send a truck back hauling that's coming out to our restaurants. We'll send it back haul to Chicago, cook it, and bring it back to DC. At our cost, whatever it takes. That's, that's a will to do. It really is. And um, so we said, okay. They said, said, could you give us, how much time can you give us so you're in trouble? Daniel said, Daniel, our son, he really runs day-to-day -day operations. He runs the farm so I can run around. And um, he said, he said uh, we can handle a month. In a month, we're going to be over our skis, but we can, we can hold things off for a month. I said, okay, give us a month. So now we're down to April 1st. Five days before April 1st, we get a call. Uh, we got a problem. <laughs> It's not going to be as easy as we thought. Okay. Well, we're now down into whatever we are in April. I've lost track of the days that I've been out traveling. But anyway, they're still struggling. And the beautiful thing is we've had several large clients step in. And, um, and, and we're still doing okay, hanging in there. We're getting the pig slaughtered. And um, I don't know where things are right now. I know Chipotle's scrambling like the Dickens. Uh, but so far, we're not in trouble. We're okay. Sales are way up. We picked up some brand new, fan, huge accounts. 
and um, and we're okay. And you know, it may be that in another month that they call us, we're going to say, "Who can give us another year?" You know, to ramp up some more. But anyway, it's quite it's quite a story, and uh, and we're 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 very. They are. An, we feel like they're an example of a huge corporate structure that they're not perfect. They make mistakes. All of us make mistakes. But they have a real heart and a desire to honor their word and to try to move, to try to push this huge thing forward. And we we honor that and appreciate it. What, however, the baby steps may be. And so we do. Okay. Wow. We got to get rolling here. Okay. So I'm supposed to talk about a vision for agriculture. What's my vision for agriculture? I think that's what the flyer says out there. So I always do what I'm told. And um, so I've got several items here as I describe a vision for agriculture. Uh, and I'm just going to run right down it, and uh, and, and we'll be we'll be ready to go. All right. So uh, first of all, I envision an agriculture that actually grows soil. You know, we haven't been growing soil for a long, long time. I mean, our whole culture is predicated on, on wearing out farms and plantations and just always being able to move west with them when you wore the old ones out. Finally, about 1900, we hit the Pacific Ocean and there wasn't any more west to go. Same thing happened in Australia. And so we, we have a time, you know, our, our legacy is one of destroying soil. I mean, in just 100 years, we've destroyed half of the soil in Iowa. You know, in the Shenandoah Valley where I'm from, um, 200 years of European occupation resulted in three to eight feet of topsoil being sent down the river uh, to the Chesapeake Bay. And, you know, so when you drive up through the Shenandoah Valley, uh, you see all those rock outcroppings, you know, from the interstate. Uh, those rocks didn't grow out of the soil. <laughs> the soil eroded from around those rocks. Okay? And so, uh, so a, 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 an agricultural system that will grow soil is what we're after. And so when we came to our farm in 1961, when I was a little, 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 little jumper, I can remember very well walking the fields and there were our areas the size of this room that, you know, that were saucer shaped that were bare shale that used to have five feet of topsoil on them. Bare shale, not a plant, not a piece of vegetation, nothing. In fact, there was so little soil on our farm when we came, when Dad started control grazing with electric fencing, there was not enough soil to hold up electric fence stakes. So he had to pour concrete in old used car tires he pushed a half inch pipe, one straight down and one on a 10% slope. My brother and I, we were little kids. He would pile these, my dad would pile these up on a tractor platform and drive real slow out through the field. And we, we would, uh, the two of us, we could get on it and kind of, you know, heave it off. And then dad would go along stick like a fence takes him across this rock and build like a fence. And today, all, there's not a single one of those areas and all of them have 12 inches of soil. Yeah. That is the kind of agriculture that we need. I, I, I look forward to the time when we grow soil with farming instead of destroying soil with farming. Number two, I look for the day when we have a food system and farmers who honor and respect the pigness of pigs and the cowness of cows and the tomatoness of tomatoes. When this community of beings, this awesome, amazing community of beings that we get to work with, when it is embraced and all of its members are respected to fill an actual physiological, physiological distinctive niche. You know, we live in a culture where the us duh and the F duh <laughs> view life, view pigs. Just stay with the idea. You pigs as just inanimate piles of protoplasmic structure to be manipulated however cleverly hubris can imagine to manipulate. Yeah. And I would suggest that a culture that views its life, its biology, its beings in that kind of egocentric, conquistador, manipulative mentality will view its citizens the same way. 
and other cultures the same. Amen. If we're going to preserve the functionality and the moral ethical framework that creates a place for Tom and Mary to express their Thomas and Maryness, it starts how we respect the least of these creates the framework on which we hang out we respect the greatest. A system like that, I envision a day in which there is not a single concentrated animal feeding operation in the entire world. Yeah. Yeah. Now, a lot of people that say, oh, but how can we possibly feed the world? They're so they're so efficient. Look how look how much they produce in a single little footprint. Let me tell you a little story. Let me tell you the truth. The truth is that when the end of, when, when the, the industry shows one of those Tyson chicken houses or Smithfield hog factories or, 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 or cattle feedlots, what they're not showing you, and they show you that, that facility and say, wow, look how efficient that is, look at that facility. What they're not showing you are the square miles required to grow the feedstuffs to cart into it and the square miles required to cart the poop out. So surrounding that house are square miles of land required to input and output that it's not a standalone deal. That's, that's the big, that's the big untold story. It's not a standalone house. It's not like all these animals are all in this house and they're just they're just you know living on air or something. You know, they're, they're, are you with me? So, so, and in our, in our farm, with all these animals, instead of being confined in a the house, they're all out on pasture, symbiotically, synergistically, complex, relationally, you know, working together. They're out here on the pastures. Even if our animals ate not a shred of grass, not a bug, not a grasshopper, not a cricket, not a grub, not a worm, not a root of multiflora rose, if our animals didn't eat anything, it wouldn't take one more acre of land to feed them than it does if they're in a confinement house. And the, and the truth is that there are edges, there are edges all over our country that are being abandoned to ecological exercise. There are road medians, there are uh, uh, National parks, national forests, there are um, conservation areas, whatever. There, I mean, Cornell, just to give you an example, Cornell did a study um, five years ago, it was a two-year study, and they, 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 uh, they asked the question, how much farmland in New York State has been abandoned in the last 15 years? Now, this is not, this is not, uh, um, you know, paved over or turned into housing. This is active farmland that within the last 50 years has been actively farmed and, and now it's just been abandoned. It's still privately owned, but there's nobody there to farm it. New York State, you ready for this? 3.1 million acres. You know, we hear a lot about developing farmland well, trust me, there's just as big an issue on abandoning farmland. And so, um, so there's plenty of land out here, especially on the edges, to, um, to, to, to handle all these things. Number three, I envision a time when good farmers are appreciated in our culture. But you know, we have this we have this idea in our culture that uh, A and B students get to go to town and become what, the lawyers and attorneys and engineers, and the, 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 D, the D students get to stay on, on farm and be farmers, because after all, the farmers are just kind of, you know, kind of tobacco sitting uh, hillbilly and dead neck, creep over the transmission in the backyard and you. I don't know about making farm, right? Well, I promote the Jeffersonian intellectual agrarian. Yeah. And 
I suggest that once we really start rewarding good farmers, it will drive the best and our brightest into farming. And, and if we're going to have an integrity food system and a landscape management system that actually massages the landscape instead of destroying the landscape, we need our best and brightest young people to enter this most sacred calling of farming and massaging our ecological umbilical. We'll know that we've attained this when the next time you go to a soccer game and all the soccer moms are out there stripping their stuff, you know, and talking about the child prodigies, you know. When one of them has the audacity to say to the other moms, well, my Mary is going to be a farmer. And all the other moms go, wow, cool, awesome. <laughs> I envision a day when the energy required on farms and food distribution, the whole energy required for food to get it on our plate drops. You know, right now, it takes 15 calories of energy to put one calorie of food on your plate. 80 years ago, it took a quarter of a calorie of energy to put one calorie of food on your plate. America's food system floats on a barrel of oil. And um, back several years ago, uh, three, uh, three, four years ago, when, when oil prices really spiked, it looks like they're returning to that level again. Uh, when they really spiked, and I saw an interesting report that really got my attention, and it said that the average farm spends 50% of their gross sales on fuel. And I mean, it just struck me. I mean, intuitively, I said, we're not doing that, but I wonder what it is. And so we conducted an internal audit to see what where we were. And even, even with all of our distribution and everything that we do, the end of the city with our food and everything, all that combined, we're still at only 5%. Wow. Because a farm that's pasture, where the animals are allowed to move and express their their well, the, you know, animals move, okay? Um, and, and, and a farm that runs on real-time solar energy doesn't take that much fuel, doesn't take that much energy. It runs on solar energy. The best solar energy in the world is sun converted to biomass. And that's still the best solar collector in the world, is biomass. And so, our whole goal as farmers is to is to create exactly the right level of massage in the ecology to stimulate more solar energy conversion into decomposable biomass than nature would do in a static state. What that means is that our farms move toward perennials instead of annuals away from tillage instead of toward tillage. And goodness gracious, certainly our government would quit subsidizing things that require tillage. <laughs> all six crops that we subsidize in the farm bill are all annuals, not perennials. And yet nature doesn't use many annuals. Nature uses perennials, just like nature runs fertility not through tillage, but by pouring decomposable carbon on the head of the soil. Earthworms like to be fed on their head. Nature doesn't till anything. I envision a day when the food system is integrated rather than segregated. We live in a segregated food system. What that means is, we say, well, segregate, what does that mean? What that means is the chickens are produced over here, the grains produced over here, the cows are produced over here, and of course they're all trucked over here to be processed, and then they're eaten over here somewhere. Nature, in nature's economy, nature doesn't, it doesn't move that stuff around that much. It 
It has it proximate. It has it embedded. You know, the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker in historical economies and societies have been embedded in a community at a human scale in which everybody can see what goes out the back door and what comes in the front door. And a human scale held in check, actually, by the fact that when you're using animal power for transportation, like horses, mules, oxen, yaks, and, 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 and camels, um, you, you simply can't amalgamate as large a volume of stuff, whether it's a leather shop or a butcher shop or a butcher baker or a candlestick shop. Um, you simply can't amalgamate a, as um, the, the scale that you can amalgamate stuff in a single spot with raw materials and and um, disseminate it out from that spot is held in check simply by the cumbersomeness, the logistical laboriousness of draft power. But today, with cheap energy and mechanization, we've been able to cut that the moorings of that ecological anchor that created a check on our ability to overrun the ecology of a locale. And now we can scale anything to whatever we want to. And what that's done is it has, it has segregated the natural cycling of eating, pooping, fertilizing, growth, eating, pooping, fertilizing, are you with me? <laughs> it, it has separated that in a segregated system to where we overrun one area with poop and we deplete another area with fertility and we even we even segregate ourselves because you know after all we're you know we're a nat our, our, where we are now as a culture is a natural extension of the Greco-Roman Western reductionized linear compartmentalized fragmentized systematized disconnected individual <laughs> And so we even we even put the people that can that can afford 1,500 square foot houses. Well, you guys can live over here in this development, and the people that can only afford 1,000 square foot houses, well, you guys live over here in this development, right? I mean, we wouldn't want a society where the 1,500 square footers would have to say hi to the thousand square footers. I mean, that's what I just wouldn't do. Yeah. I was in Texas late, lately and, and there was a lady came up to me she, and she said she just got fined by her homeowners association in her, in her uh, community there, homeowners association, because they have a covenant that uh, precludes farming in their homeowners association. I mean, we don't want anything going, like, eh, eh, farming. Farming is what brown people do. <laughs> I'm not always politically correct. <laughs> so, so here we've got this, this community. So I got fine. I said, why? She said, because I grew a tomato plant in my flower bed. That's farm. Now, now can you, I want you to just think the kind of segregated thinking, the, the economic apartheid thinking that a neighbor would think for seeing that tomato plant turning her into a homeowners association for a tomato plant. That's the kind of segregation. So what, we, what we're looking for is an integrated system. What we want, nature integrates things. What that means is we, we grow as many plants as we can in our houses. We bring chickens into our houses. We don't, we don't take the, the kitchen scraps and put them in buckets and send them 10 miles out of town on a, on a diesel truck to a composting place so we can re-import the compost to feed our plants. No, we bring the chickens in next to the kitchen and we take the kitchen scraps, feed them to the chickens, the chickens lay us eggs. Nothing has to go on a truck anywhere. That's an integrated system. And, in, and embedded system. I envision a day when we increase the immunological terrain of our plants and animals to where the immune system is enhanced instead of degraded. You know, on our farm, when an animal gets sick, when an animal gets sick, 
We don't assume, oh, oh, apparently that's a pharmaceutically disadvantaged animal. <laughs> You know, we assume when a plant or an animal gets sick, we look in the mirror and say, what did I do? I mean, this is the old terrain versus germ theory. It's Antoine Bosch, uh, Bichamp versus uh, Louis Pasteur, all right? And, and, and this, this whole conflict between, um, between creating a terrain of immunology versus uh, annihilation of the germs, it is, is an ongoing debate. In fact, uh, we now have the um, we now have the, the uh, hygiene theory uh, that's been endorsed by a lot of doctors, especially um, uh, doctors that, that handle allergies. And what they say is that your immune system needs a little bit of assaulting. And when you are when you sterilize everything, you create a lethargic immune system that can't handle anything. And so now you've got asthma, you've got all these, you know, a little bit of pollen in the air. Suddenly you have extraordinary responses to what should be just ordinary things because we're all sterilizing everything. Well, we're not sterile. We're pretty far from sterile. Uh, in fact, we have three trillion bacteria inside of us. You know, and, and, and around us and in us. And if we could take a picture of ourselves sitting here on the bacterial level, we'd all look like a pig pen in a Peanuts comic strip. <laughs> we're, we're really not homo sapiens, we're bacteria sapiens. And so it, we think it's very helpful when something gets sick, it's very helpful to say, well, what, what did my management do to allow this sickness to happen? as opposed to just looking at that sickness and say, oh, apparently I'm not buying enough drugs. <laughs> I envision a day when there is a short chain of custody between field and fork instead of a long chain of custody. The shorter the chain of custody, the safer, the fresher, the more nutrient dense, the better tasting, the more transparent, the more accountable, accountable, accountability, accountable. <clears throat> a short chain of custody, of course, means local food. And a lot of people, you know, they, they immediately say, oh, well, look, you, 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 what are you trying to do? You know, cut off all this commerce. Well, I'm not trying to cut off commerce. We, we've been shipping stuff around the planet for a, a very, very, very long time. But you simply can't afford, especially in an energy, um, a problematic energy cycle to ship the amount of water that we're shipping in this country. Especially when it comes to watermelons and cantaloupes and strawberries and, 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 and mescaline mix and salad greens and, and cabbage and broccoli and lettuce, all those things. Those things have never been shipped before in history. Never. They've always been uh, grown close. It's the exotics. You know, it's the stuff that can't be grown in a locale that gets shipped. Oranges. Um, nutrient dense stuff. You know, jerky. Um, proteins. Uh, moldy cheese. Okay? Nutrient dense stuff. Spices. Okay? That's, that's historically what could be shipped. Because you simply couldn't afford to ship Not, stuff that was 95% water and not exotic and that could be grown anywhere, you simply couldn't afford to ship it anywhere. So that, that was seasonally produced, integrated, locally produced in kitchen gardens. You know, in 1946, 50% of all the fruits and vegetables in America were grown in backyard gardens. In 1946, that's not very far along, far, uh, far since. I mentioned the day when there is transparency from farm to kitchen. You know, we live in a time when we are we are locking up our farms. Okay. When we're when we're locking up our farms with no trespassing signs. You know, on our farm, our commitment to transparency is that anyone, any of you, is welcome to come to our farm 
at any day of the year, from anywhere in the world, unannounced, 24-7, 365, to see anything, anywhere. That's our commitment to transparency, because we've got nothing to hide. Smithfield Hog Factory or a, or a San Joaquin Valley uh, fumigated strawberry field, you've got to, you know, you go visit there, there's a big no trespassing sign at the entrance. If you get past that, you've got to walk through sheep dip and put on a hazmat suit to go visit it. Let me tell you something, if you got to put on a, go through sheep dip and a hazmat suit and go visit your food, you might not want to eat it. <laughs> I saw a fascinating sign in Australia recently when I was over there. It looked like a no trespassing sign, but what it said was, instead of no trespassing, it said, trespassers will be impressed. <laughs> I like that. Wow. I like that. You know, Michael Pollan, the Omnivore's Dilemma, said that if we put glass walls on all of our CAFOs in this country, it would fundamentally change the way Americans eat because we would see what goes on there. And so transparent farms are a big deal. Nine, food costs would be internalized rather than externalized. Now what happens today is, when people talk about, you know, they accuse me of being an elitist. Yeah. I can't afford your food, you know, you're some sort of elitist. I don't understand why wanting to eat like grandma did is elitist. <laughs> but anyway, the fact is that the food that I produce doesn't give anybody foodborne bacterial damage. We're not giving anybody MRSA, C. diff, or other pathogenic toxic reactions. We're not polluting anybody's water. Our farm is aesthetically and aromatically sensually romantic. <laughs> and that's the way it ought to be. It ought to be enticing to a class of kindergartners. Kindergart kindergartners shouldn't come to the farm and say, ooh, yuck, it stinks. <laughs> Because if it stinks, it's not good food production, just like a stinky kitchen isn't a good chicken or a kitchen production. I mean, God gave us our senses for a reason. Not so we could say, you know, um, sniff up an obnoxious air and say, oh, country air. No, that's, that's called mismanagement. <laughs> and what we have right now is we have a food system that is externalizing its costs and skewing the real cost of food through subsidies, through through not having a nature a, a PL statement in nature. There's a long lag time on nature's profit and loss statement. Long lag time. And we don't have a real time, you know, wouldn't it be cool if every day in the newspaper right up along the Dow Jones Industrial Average, it would give us a, a, a uh, an ecological PL statement for the day, you know, we can see it go up or down. McDonald's out at a restaurant, you know, it goes down. <laughs> a new buying club starts in, a, in, in, in Tampa, you know, it goes up. <laughs> but when, but when, when food costs are internalized, then there's honesty in the system. Number 10, I envision a day when we are eating living food, not dead food. Oh, right on. You know, Everything that's done in research in America today is all about trying to kill food way before it should be killed. See, the truth is that the cycle of life is life, then there's a sacrifice, and there's a, a decomposition or a, or a consumption, and then there's an excretion that creates fertility for regeneration, which then creates new life. That's the way the natural cycle works. But it takes life to make life. And what we've done in our culture is that we're, we're, we're trying to make dead food. We, we uh, you know, the research is about shelf life, stabilization, um, you know, creating uh, cardboard cardboard tomatoes <laughs> so that they can they can ship and bounce up and down in a tractor trailer from California to Virginia <laughs> without turning to pulp. <laughs> that kind of genetic research does not increase nutrition. 
It just lets us eat compost. <laughs> Do it again. And I think you got it the first time. But this living food thing is a big deal. Food should rot. If it doesn't rot, it won't decompose. One of the most amazing things I saw recently was out at Fort Bragg in California of a, a farm to a farm to school program. Two ladies were running this three-acre farm adjacent to these to the to the schools, and they busted the kids out. They incorporated the, the farm into the um, into the environment, environmental studies curriculum. So the first thing, first day the students come, the, the, the farmers say, "Now what we're going to do? Uh, we want their homework is to bring us uh, food." And so the kids. They come out and they bring, you know, white Wonder Bread, and they bring Twizzlers and M&Ms and, um, you know, uh, Twinkies and Cocoa Puffs and stuff like that. And with the, at the farm, they've got this big, long, uh, about a six or seven foot um, vermicomposting box with worms in it, a worm bed in a big box about, you know, six feet by two feet by three feet high. So they opened the lid and they, they buried all the students, all the kids' stuff over here this section. And over here, the farm gals, they bring some uh, fresh baked uh, stone ground whole wheat bread. They ball it up, don't put it in there. They put an apple in there, a banana. They put in, uh, uh, you know, a potato and some ground beef. They put it in there. Two weeks later, the kids come back. They open the box and see what we found. So they turn the kids over here. You know, Look in there, what do you find? Of course, the kids get in there, you know, all the worms and all this stuff. You know, they're digging through this. It's cool, you know, let's get in there. Now, they can't find anything. It's just, you know, worms and earthworm castings. It's just black. It just looks good. So they go over here and they look, start digging in there. Well, you know, here they, they pull out the Twizzlers, they pull out the Cheerios, they pull out the, you know, they pull out the, the you know, the, the round ball of white Wonder Bread, you know, it looks just like it was when it went in, like a real soft ball. Pull all this stuff out. And then the farmers look at the students and say, okay, so the question is, why would you want to eat something worms won't even eat? Isn't that great? It's an extremely visceral object lesson. And, and, and so I envision a day when everything that you and I are eating will rot, will decompose, is it, living because it's in that living food that it sacrifices for us to give us life to go on. Eleven, I envision the day when we can eat pronounceable food. <laughs> when we got all this stuff put on on labels, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could just actually read a label and you didn't have to have a chemist degree to read a label? Deoxyhydro nucleic whatever. Readable labels, stuff that you know what it is. And we're the, it's amazing how much unpronounceable food is in there. I'm kind of with Michael Pollan. We shouldn't eat any food that wasn't available before 1900. You know, that's kind of a, a benchmark of when food should have been, that's kind of the cutoff. If it wasn't available before 1900, we probably shouldn't eat it. And we can all be very thankful that hot dogs were introduced at the 1890 World's Fair. <laughs> okay, right in at the end. Number 12, I envision a day when domestic culinary arts are rediscovered. Here's the deal. We love to be victims, don't we? Oh, we love to be victims. And the problem I see is I travel around and speak to all sorts of groups. The problem I see is that most people, I mean, nobody here, I know, but most people think that if those people over there just made better decisions, we'd be good. You know, and, and, and if those people over there just made better decisions, everything would be fine. And the truth is, there aren't those people and those people, there's just us. And so we need to understand that the weak link in this entire system is not money, it's not research, it's not know-how, it's not resource. Our weak link 
is participation. Participating in it. I mean, we live in a culture where the average person is far more passionately interested and knowledgeable about the latest belly button piercing in Hollywood celebrity culture than they are what's going to become flesh of their flesh and bone of their bones at 6 o'clock. And you got to put down People magazine once in a while and study a recipe book. You know, the average American male between the ages of 25 and 35, the average American male spends 20 hours a week on video games. Are we really that uncreative? Are we really that 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 void of pleasure? You know, why can't why can't we derive as much pleasure from the from the, the awesome magic of, of watching a tomato seed sprout into a tomato plant and and, and grow succulent, juicy tomatoes that just burst in your mouth. Why is that not pleasurable compared to being the, the, the best uh, you know, the best player on Angry Birds? <laughs> I mean, are we really that devoid of creativity and appreciation and visceral connection to our food relationships? And I suggest that, that we need to get in our kitchens. The first line of defense of this whole thing is to get in our kitchens and, and, and just quit patronizing the supermarket, quit patronizing the processed food industry with red dye 29 and unpronounceable food and stabilizers and emulsifiers and irradiation and amalgamated, extruded, dehydrated, rehydrated, prostituted, adulterated fecal soup. Let's, let's start, let's get in our kitchens to prepare package and preserve ourselves, ultimately our, our food system is the direct result of years of billions of individual decisions. And where it goes in the future, whatever it looks like 10 years from now or 20 years from now, is also going to be a physical manifestation of billions of individual decisions. Like, do I get the $5 Starbucks latte, or do I spend that money to get a pastured chicken instead of a Tyson chicken? Do I take the Caribbean cruise? Or do I say, oh, wait a minute, it's almost the end of tomato season. I don't know why I'm stuck on tomatoes. I'm stuck on tomatoes. They're just, I mean, they're just a wonderful thing, right? Tomatoes, good tomatoes. I mean, if there's one thing that really shows the difference between industrial and backyard tomatoes, tomatoes are the, yeah. So, do I take the Caribbean cruise? Or knowing the season, knowing the time, do I say, do I call up my local couple farmers and say, hey, I'll take, you know, four bushels of, of, of slightly blemished tomatoes at a little price reduction if you'll bring them to me and, and, we'll, and we'll spend the week making, canning uh, juice and making salsa for the week. Yeah. You know, these are individual decisions that we make. I've got two more. Number 13. I envision a day when edible landscaping is cool. Yeah. Well, I should have done that earlier. There are 35 million acres of lawn in the U.S. 35 million acres of lawn. There are 36 million acres housing and feeding recreational horses. That's 71 million acres of land. That's enough to feed our entire country without a single farm. Wow. 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 Yeah, that, it, what can you say? Wow. Yeah, that's all you can say. Why can't we take our campuses, our institutional settings of campuses, and divide them up into uh, grids, you know, with GPS technology. I mean, look, make edible landscaping sexy and cool. No, okay. So, we, so all the students get a get a phone, you know, a smartphone with a with an app on it, and and in the morning the app 
uh, you, you wake up, you flip open your phone, you see your app, and it says the strawberries in grid 138 or grade 15, all the students order fixed strawberries. <laughs> And he showed an aerial picture of a 250, a quarter million person city, 250,000 people that China had just put in. You know, in China they can do that. He won a 250,000 person city right there. You know. <laughs> now here was the stipulation on the design of the city. Ready for this? The stipulation was that it had to produce as much food after the city was in as it did before it went in. And so here they had, there were 250,000 uh, people living in this. All the buildings were five stories. They all looked identical. I mean, after all, it is China. And all looked identical. They were all five stories. And all the roofs were covered in squash and cucumber plants. And all the water drained into cisterns. And they pumped, they pumped it up, back up on top, probably with bicycle pumps. Pumped back up on top, water. Now suddenly, this whole city of 250,000 people didn't have to worry about any storm storm drains because all the water was captured in cister, cisterns and sent back up on the rooftop. They didn't have to worry about air conditioning because the cascading plants came out over the side. You know, everybody from third floor up could just reach out the window and pick a cucumber. You know, melon, squash. You know, and. And it, it was it was it was warm in the winter with all the thermal you know of the of the uh, the soil up there the the, the vermiculite and all this stuff and why can't we do this? You can. It's being done right here, okay. But why why should this be such a a, a difficult, strange, weird thing to do? This should be normal. It should be normal. And so uh, edible landscaping. Uh, uh, you, know, you go to Italy, and, uh, and, and they don't mow their expressway intersections with big fat wing, uh, fat wing you know, mowers behind tractors, you know, the state employees. They dip them up into a quarter acre lots. And I don't know how they do it, whether it's rent or lottery or what. Anyway, they dip them up into a quarter acre lots. And, and all of them are gardens that are managed by people who come out from town live on their little garden pot for the weekend, work it, weed it, pick it, that sort of thing. They, they, they have a little tool shed and a little, you know, day bed thing and they can stay there. And then, you know, Sunday evening, they take all the stuff that they got over the weekend and go back into town and eat it for a week and sell it to their friends and neighbors and give it to, you know, family and stuff like that. And the next weekend they come back out. I mean, and this is the way they take care of their land. I mean, can you imagine if all of our interstate medians and expressway ramps and stuff are all growing edible food? I mean, we, we, can, we can empty our prisons with inmates to, to start their own businesses growing food, sell them in a farmer's market. I mean, something useful instead of locking them up. Finally, I envision a day when the food police at the us duh and the f duh back off and allow every American citizen freedom of food choice to eat the food of their choice.
What good is it to have guns or be able to own guns or to be able to uh, 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 worship or speak or assemble? What good are those freedoms if I can't choose the fuel to feed my internal community to give me the energy to go shoot pray? <laughs> so I envision a time when, when we have an actually a, a constitutional amendment to the Bill of Rights that gives us a food emancipation proclamation for freedom of food choice in which we emancipate our food system from the enslavement of these people that are running around today, if you don't believe it, go see Farm Again, uh, with, with SWAT teams invading people's freezers, taking out their private supply of food because it doesn't meet the official government protocol for healthy eating. We are the Native Americans. We represent the heritage food system. And we need to appreciate that there has to be a place carved out that we can sit in our teepee, our wigwam, and enjoy our, 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 our heritage traditional roots in the face of a 7th Cavalry that doesn't ride horses and run 30-30 caliber rifles anymore. They sit in business suits in government offices and in Wall Street and with a conquistador mentality and the 7th Cavalry and continue to prey on the ba most basic freedom and unalienable rights. It's not inalienable, it's unalienable. There, nobody can put a lien on these rights of our freedom to choose how to feed our internal community of beings. Okay. Basic, it is one of the most basic freedoms there can be of personal autonomy and personal ownership of my own being to choose what to feed my being. And a, and a country that shuts that freedom down, nothing else can be far behind. And we're seeing a proliferation of best management practices called BMPs, good agricultural practices called GAPs, that are being designed as a protocol for farming production that are becoming the template for what is legal to sell, what is legal for a restaurant to serve, what's legal to come in the back door of this of, 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 of any restaurant, what's legal to go onto a supermarket shelf or be sold at a farmer's market or a CSA or even fed to your own family. And, and, and trust me, these protocols, the protocol for manure is not compost, it's legumes. I mean, we want to keep the manure out of water. We don't want to put it in water. The, 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 the BMP for, uh, for poultry is not pasture. It's confinement chicken houses where we can control the scientific accuracy, the environmental, you know, the environment that the chickens raised in. And so I envision a day when we carve out in our culture a place for those of us who would dare to say, I'll be responsible for this community, thank you very much, yeah. Yeah. and I'll make those decisions, yeah. and I'll take the risks. And those risks are going to be way less, I think, because I'm doing it the way nature has done it for a long, long time. Our guinea pig experiment with mechanical industrial food is very, very young, and it is already wreaking havoc with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, with uh, leuke onset leukemia, with cancer, with heart disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, E. coli, salmonella, C. diff, MRSA, I mean you can just go on and on and on. The track record for the current system is not good and, and, and we need to preserve this, this spot where those of us who have not bowed they exercise our freedom of choice. That's my vision for the future. <laughs> I'll conclude with this. I'll conclude with this. You've all heard, and, and it, it seems daunting. Daunting. What do you mean? Okay, folks? My kitchen? What? Ah! Use a canner? Ah! What? Blows up? Ah! <laughs> New stuff scares us to death, doesn't it? 
Sure it does. You mean, you mean, you mean, I might have to cancel one of my kids' 10 extracurricular activities so I have time to stay home and, and take care of my family? <laughs> Let me tell you something. You've all heard Grandma say, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Right? You know what? Grandma was wrong. The truth is, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly first. You don't do anything right the first time. I mean, can you imagine a Thanksgiving family gathering? We're all at Thanksgiving here, and, and all the cousins and aunts and uncles and all they're all around. And the newest little addition to the, you know, to the tribe is down here, you know, um, sniff up an obnoxious air and say, "Oh, country air." No, that's that's called mismanagement. <laughs> And what we have right now is we have a food system that is externalizing its costs and skewing the real cost of food through subsidies, through, through not having a, a, a P&L statement in nature. There's a long lag time on nature's profit and loss statement. Long lag time. We don't have a real time, you know, wouldn't it be cool if every day in the newspaper right up along the Dow Jones Industrial Average, it would give us a, 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 uh, an ecological P&L statement for the day, you know, we can see it go up or down, you know. McDonald's out at a restaurant, you know, it goes down. <laughs> a new buying club starts in, a, in, in, in Tampa, you know, it goes up. <laughs> but when, but when, when food costs are internalized, then there's honesty in the system. Number 10, I envision a day when we are eating living food, not dead food. Yeah, right on. You know, everything that's done in research in America today is all about trying to kill food way before it should be killed. See, the truth is that the cycle of life is life then there's a sacrifice, and there's a, a decomposition or a, or a consumption, and then there's an excretion that creates fertility for regeneration, which then creates new life. That's the way the natural cycle works. But it takes life to make life. And what we've done in our culture is that we're, we're, we're trying to make dead food. We, we uh, you know, the research is about shelf life, stabilization, um, you know, creating uh, cardboard, cardboard tomatoes <laughs> so that they can, they can ship and build something down in a tractor trailer from California to Virginia without turning to pulp. <laughs> that kind of genetic research does not increase nutrition. It just lets us eat compost. <laughs> Do it again. And I think you got it the first time. <laughs> but this living food thing is a big deal. Food should rot. If it doesn't rot, it won't decompose. One of the most amazing things I saw recently was out at Fort Bragg in California of a, a farm to a farm to school program. Two ladies were running this three-acre farm adjacent to these to the to the schools, and they busted the kids out and incorporated the, the farm into the um, into the environment, environmental studies curriculum. So the first thing, the first day the students come, the, the, the farmers say, "Now what we're going to do? Uh, we want their homework is to bring us uh, food," and so the kids. They come out and they bring, you know, white Wonder Bread, and they bring Twizzlers and M&Ms and, um, you know, uh, Twinkies and Cocoa Puffs and stuff like that. And with the, at the farm, they've got this big, long, uh, about a six or seven foot um, vermicomposting box with worms in it, a worm bed in a big box about, you know, six feet by two feet by three feet high. So they opened the lid and they, they buried all the students, all the kids' stuff over here in this section. And over here, the farm gals, they bring 
some uh, fresh baked um, stone ground whole wheat bread. They ball it up, they don't put it in there. They put an apple in there, a banana. They put in, uh, uh, you know, a potato and some ground beef. They put it in there. Two weeks later, the kids come back. They open the box and see what we found. So they turn the kids over here. You know, they say, look in there, what do you find? Of course, the kids get in there, you know, all the worms and all this stuff. You know, they're digging through this. Cool, you know, it's, it's in there. Now they can't find anything. It's just you know worms and earthworm castles. It's just black. It just looks good. So they go over here and they look, start digging in there. Well, you know, here they, they pull out the Twizzlers, they pull out the Cheerios, they pull out the you know, they pull out the, the you know the, the round ball of white wonder bread. You know, it looks just like it was when it went in, like a you know, soft ball. Pull all this stuff out. And then the farmers look at the students and say, okay, so the question is, why would you want to eat something worms won't even eat? <laughs> for us to give us life to go on. Eleven, I envision the day when we can eat pronounceable food. <laughs> when we got all this stuff put on on labels, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could just actually read a label and you didn't have to have a chemist degree to read a label? Deoxyhydro, nucleus, whatever. Readable labels. Stuff that you know what it is. And we're the, it's amazing how much unpronounceable food is in there. I'm kind of with Michael Pollard. We shouldn't eat any food that wasn't available before 1900. You know, that's kind of a, a benchmark of when food should have been, that's kind of the cutoff. If it wasn't available before 1900, we probably shouldn't eat it. And we can all be very thankful that hot dogs were introduced at the 1890 World's Fair. <laughs> Came right in at the end. Number 12, I envision a day when domestic culinary arts are rediscovered. Here's the deal. We love to be victims, don't we? Oh, we love to be victims. And the problem I see is I travel around and speak to all sorts of groups. The problem I see is that most people, I mean, nobody here, I know, but most people think that if those people over there just made better decisions, we'd be good. You know, and, and, and if those people over there just made better decisions, everything would be fine. And the truth is, there aren't those people and those people, there's just us. And so we need to understand that the weak link in this entire system is not money, it's not research, it's not know-how, it's not resource. Our weak link is participation. Participating. I mean, we live in a culture where the average person is far more passionately interested and knowledgeable about the latest belly button piercing in Hollywood celebrity culture than they are what's going to become flesh of their flesh and bone of their bones at 6 o'clock. And you got to put down People magazine once in a while and study a recipe book. You know, the average American male between the ages of 25 and 35, the average American male spends 20 hours a week on video games. Are we really that uncreative? Are we really that 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 void of pleasure? You know, why can't why can't we derive as much pleasure from the from the, the awesome magic of, of watching a tomato seed sprout into a tomato plant and, and, and grow succulent, juicy tomatoes that just burst in your mouth? Why is that not pleasurable compared to being the, the, the best uh, you know, the best player on Angry Birds. <laughs> I mean, are we really that devoid of creativity and appreciation and visceral connection to our food relationships? 
And I suggest that, that we need to get in our kitchens. The first line of defense this whole thing is to get in our kitchens and, and, and just quit patronizing the supermarket, quit patronizing the processed food industry with Red Dye 29 and unpronounceable food and stabilizers and emulsifiers and irradiation and amalgamated, extruded, dehydrated, rehydrated, phosphorated, adulterated fecal soup. Let's, let's start, let's get in our kitchens to prepare, package, and preserve ourselves. Ultimately, our our food system is the direct result of years of billions of individual decisions. And where it goes in the future, whatever it looks like 10 years from now or 20 years from now, is also going to be a physical manifestation of billions of individual decisions. Like, do I get the $5 Starbucks latte? Or do I spend that money to get a pastured chicken instead of a Tyson chicken? Do I take the Caribbean cruise? Or do I say, oh, wait a minute. It's almost the end of tomato season. Oh, wow, I'm stuck on tomatoes. I'm stuck on tomatoes. They're just, I mean, they're just a wonderful thing, aren't they? Tomatoes. Good tomatoes. I mean, if there's one thing that really shows the difference between industrial and backyard tomatoes, yeah. tomatoes are yeah. Yeah. So, do I take the Caribbean cruise, or knowing the season, knowing the time, do I say, do I call up my local couple farmers and say, hey, I'll take, you know, four bushels of, of, of slightly blemished tomatoes at a little price reduction if you'll bring them to me, and, and, we'll, and we'll spend the week making, canning uh, juice and making salsa for the way. Yeah. You know, these are individual decisions that we make. I've got two more. Number 13. I envision a day when edible landscaping is cool. Yeah. That's 71 million acres of land. That's enough to feed our entire country without a single farm. Wow. 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 Yeah. Uh, it, it, what can you say? Wow. wow. Yeah, that's all you can say. Why can't we take our campuses, our institutional settings of campuses, and divide them up into uh, grids, you know, with GPS technology. I mean, look, make edible landscaping sexy and cool. No, okay. So, we, so all the students get a get a phone, you know, a smartphone with a with an app on it, and and in the morning the app, uh, you, you wake up, you flip open your phone, you see your app, and it says the strawberries in grid 138 or grade 50, and all the students order fresh strawberries. <laughs> And he showed an aerial picture of a 250, a quarter million person city, 250,000 people that China had just put in. You know, in China, they can do that. He won a 250,000 person city right there. You know? <laughs> now, here was the stipulation on the design of the city. Ready for this? The stipulation was that it had to produce as much food after the city was in as it did before it went in. And so here they had 250,000 uh, people living in this. All the buildings were five stories. They all looked identical. I'm after all, it is China. And all looked identical. They were all five stories. And all the roofs were covered in squash and cucumber plants. And all the water drained into cisterns. And they pumped, they pumped it up back up on top, probably with bicycle pumps. Come back up on top 
water. Now suddenly this whole city of 250,000 people didn't have to worry about any storm, storm drains because all the water was captured in cister, cisterns and sent back up on the rooftop. They didn't have to worry about air conditioning because the cascading plants came out over the side and everybody from third floor and up could just reach out the window and pick a cucumber, you know. Watermelon, <laughs> squash, you know. And, and it, it, was, it, was, it was warm in the winter with all the thermal, you know, of the, of the, uh, the soil up there, the, the, the vermiculite and all this stuff. And why can't we do this? You can. It's being done right here. Okay. But why, why should this be such a, a, a difficult, strange, weird thing to do? This should be normal. It should be normal. And so uh, edible landscaping. Uh, uh, you, know, you go to Italy, and, uh, and, and they don't mow their expressway intersections with big fat wing, uh, fat wing you know, mowers behind tractors, you know, with state employees. They dip them up into a quarter acre lots. And I don't know how they do it, whether it's rent or lottery or what. Anyway, they dig it up in little quarter acre lots. And, and all of them are gardens that are managed by people who come out from town, live on their little garden pot for the weekend, work it, weed it, pick it, that sort of thing. They, they, they have a little tool shed and a little, you know, day bed thing. And they can stay there. And then, you know, Sunday evening, they take all the stuff that they got over the weekend and go back into town and eat it for a week and sell it to their friends and neighbors and give it to you know family and stuff like that. And the next weekend they come back out. I mean, and this is the way they take care of their land. I mean, can you imagine if all of our interstate medians and expressway ramps and stuff were all growing edible food? I mean, we, we, can, we can empty our prisons with inmates to, to start their own businesses growing food, sell them in the farmer's market. I mean, something useful instead of locking them up. Finally, I envision a day when the food police at the us duh and the F duh back off and allow every American citizen freedom of food choice to eat the food of their choice. to feed your kids on Twinkies and Cocoa Puffs and Mountain Dew, the raw milk, pasture chickens, compost-grown tomatoes, and Aunt Matilda's homemade pickles are hazardous substances. <laughs> I say, when the government gets between my lips and my throat, I call that an invasion of privacy. <laughs> and if we don't have the freedom to choose the food of our choice to feed our three trillion member internal community, what good is it to have guns or be able to own guns or to be able to uh, uh, worship or speak or assemble? What good are those freedoms if I can't choose the fuel to feed my internal community to give me the energy to go shoot, pray, So I envision a time when, when we have an actually a, a constitutional amendment to the Bill of Rights that gives us a food emancipation proclamation for freedom of food choice, in which we emancipate our food system from the enslavement of these people that are running around today, if you don't believe it, go see Farmageddon, uh, with, with SWAT teams invading people's freezers, taking out their private supply of food because it doesn't meet the official government protocol for healthy eating. We are the Native Americans. We represent the heritage food system. And we need to appreciate that there has to be a place carved out that we can sit in our teepee, our wigwam, and enjoy our, 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 our heritage traditional roots in the face of a 7th Cavalry that doesn't ride horses and run 30-30 caliber rifles anymore. They sit in business suits in government offices and in Wall Street and with a conquistador mentality and the 7th Cavalry and continue to prey on the most basic freedom and unalienable right. It's not inalienable, it's unalienable. There, nobody can put a lien on these rights 
of our freedom to choose how to feed our internal community of beings. Basic freedoms there can be of personal autonomy and personal ownership of my own being to choose what to feed my being. And a, and a country that shuts that freedom down, nothing else can be far behind. And we're seeing a proliferation of best management practices called BMPs, good agricultural practices called GAPs that are being designed as a protocol for farming production that are becoming the template for what is legal to sell, what is legal for a restaurant to serve, what's legal to come in the back door of, this re of, 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 of any restaurant, what's legal to go onto a supermarket shelf or be sold at a farmer's market or a CSA or even fed to your own family. And, and, and trust me, these protocols, the protocol for manure is not compost, it's legumes. I mean, we want to keep the manure out of water, we don't want to put it in water. The, 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 the BMP for, uh, for poultry is not pasture, it's confined to chicken houses where we can control the scientific accuracy, the environmental, you know, the environment that the chickens raised in. And so I envision a day when we carve out in our culture a place for those of us who would dare to say, I'll be responsible for this community, thank you very much, yeah. Yeah. and I'll make those decisions, yeah. and I'll take the risks. And those risks are going to be way less, I think, because I'm doing it the way nature has done it for a long, long time. Our guinea pig experiment with mechanical industrial food is very, very young, and it is already wreaking havoc with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, with uh, onset leukemia, with cancer, with heart disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, E. coli, salmonella, C. diff, MRSA. I mean, you can just go on and on and on. The track record for the current system is not good. And, and, and we need to preserve this, this spot where those of us who have not bowed may exercise our freedom of choice. That's my vision for the future. You've all heard, and, and it, it seems daunting. Daunting? What do you mean? Okay, folks? Ah! What? Get in my kitchen? What? Ah! You know, use a canner? Ah! Oh, what if it blows up? Ah! <laughs> New stuff scares us to death, doesn't it? Sure it does. You mean, you mean, you mean, I might have to cancel one of my kids' 10 extracurricular activities so I have time to stay home and, and take care of my family? Ah! <laughs> Let me tell you something. You've all heard Grandma say, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Right? You know what? Grandma was wrong. The truth is, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly first. You don't do anything right the first time. I mean, can you imagine a Thanksgiving family gathering where all the Thanksgiving here and, and all the cousins and aunts and uncles and all they're all around and the newest little addition to the you know to the tribe is down here, you know, around on the floor in diapers. Jill Janey will call her, you know, she's seven, eight months old, something like that. You know, and, and, we, and she's crawling around the floor, all of a sudden she comes over to a chair and she gets a hold of the leg and she kind of, you know, herself up. And she kind of holds on to the edge of the chair. She looks around you terrified. Suddenly, somebody sees her and says, Oh, look, Jamie's starting to walk. Suddenly, everybody you know, looks at Jamie and, I love you, Jamie. And Jamie realizes you know, she's the center of attention. This is the thing, you know, and she loses her focus. And she you know, walks <laughs> down on the ground you know, on her diaper. On her now, what happens? Here's what happens, right? Everybody gathers around Jamie and says, Jamie, if you can't walk any better than that, just quit. <laughs> Adulthood, 
and that we become paranoid of trying something new because what if it fails? What if I burn this day? What if I, what, what if one of the cans of beans doesn't seal? What if I just box a little? What if the egg breaks? I'm going to have eight jokes me in a buying club and say, how do you make a hamburger? I said, are you kidding me? My family's been, you know, vegetarian for 10 years, and now we realize the best way to uh, sequester carbon and heal the plants with pasture-based livestock, and so now we're making up for lost time. My husband wants a hamburger. I don't have to eat. <laughs> the truth is, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly first. Because we don't talk well first, we don't walk well first, and we don't even poop well first. we got to learn all this stuff. And so, yes, this vision is daunting. And it hasn't come overnight, and it won't end overnight, and we don't know how to fix every nuance overnight. But every one of us, somewhere in our lives, can embrace this awesome, magnificent community of beings in the soil, in our insides, around us including the plants and the animals of this unbelievably abundant natural womb that we've been blessed to be uh, uh, put in in this nest, we can participate in it individually and make decisions poorly if necessary that will, uh, that will participate in this wonderful embrace of an object lesson of providential grace and care in this ecological womb that we call home. We can do that. Now may all of your carrots grow long and straight. May your radishes be large and not pithy. May your tomatoes be immune to blossom and rot. May all of your culinary experiments be edible. <laughs> May the rain fall gently on your fields, the wind be always at your back, your children rise up and call you blessed, and may we all make our world a better place than we are. Thank you.